So this week, we are wrapping up a three-part series, a teaching conversation about God. What a big topic. <laughs> and so we've, we've talked about the concept of three in one. That's the title of the series, mainly because when we talk about God, particularly when Christians talk about God, we talk about the Trinity. We talk about God the Father, God the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit. And so we spent the last two weeks talking about the two persons of the Trinity, the Father and the Son. And I gotta be honest, every single week as I've gotten off stage, especially around Monday or Tuesday, I'm like, oh man, there's so much more I could have said. I just wish I would have said this. I wish we'd have read this scripture. I wish we'd have talked about that thing because the concept of God is just, poof. in the very first week, I said this, it is not up to us to understand God. He isn't expecting that from us and it's impossible for us to do so, but um, we want to, right? And so he's given us a lot of things to consider and things to know about him. And so it's been a really fun conversation. I hope that it's enriched your spiritual life or answered some of your questions. Last week, we left off talking about Jesus. Uh, Jesus, God in the flesh, the incarnation of the creator who comes to the earth. And if you missed any of that, go back and check it out on our podcast. We also bank our sermons on, um, on YouTube, on our channel there. Go catch on that because you, you're going to want to hear that. But Jesus' whole life on earth was only about 33 years. Like in the grand scope of world history, that's not very long. Boop. A lot of you in this room are older than 33 years old. You would look at Jesus and be like, young man, right? And so for such a short period, and then, and then of that 33 years, only like three and a half of those years was his public ministry, where he's doing miracles and he's teaching and he's Messiah stuff, you know, he's doing that stuff. Three and a half years of all of world history. And look at where the church is today. Jesus becomes the foundation for the church. It's amazing the impact that only three and a half years would have on so many people. Have you ever thought about that? It's amazing, but here's the deal. Three and a half years, and then he resurrects from the grave, goes into heaven. We talked about that last week, and he's just gone. And his followers are like, uh, what do we do now? <laughs> Where'd you go? And this is a phenomenon that happens a lot in our, in our world. Uh, if you're a football fan, I'm a big NFL fan myself, and uh, go Dallas Cowboys. We traded Amari Cooper. I'm a little upset about that, but we'll make it up. It's okay. But there's big leaders in sports sometimes, like NFL. You think about Tom Brady, okay? You love him, you hate him, it doesn't matter. You can't deny the impact he's made on football. He is very likely the GOAT, okay? And so he's doing it, he's up in New England. Uh, anybody never heard of Tom Brady? Okay, go watch TV. He's changing things. He's in New England and he is taking a program that was nothing, makes it into the championship team, championship after championship after championship. People in New England are like, yeah, we're just planning for the Super Bowl this year. And then guess what happens? He's done. He leaves New England, he goes to Tampa Bay, good deal for them, terrible deal for, Tampa, for, for New England because what are they doing? What do we do now? What do we do now? Then our leader is gone. This happens all the time. Uh, in world history, it happens in, on, the, on, on big nation stages. Uh, I'm a big fan of the musical Hamilton. Anybody Hamilton fans? I love Hamilton. My wife and I have tickets to go soon. Oh, I'm pumped. Um, I already memorized it real quick, and, then, and now I'm going to go just see if I remember all the words. Uh, Hamilton's a, a Broadway musical. I'm not even a musical guy. I'm more of a history nerd. But they nail the history of this. And there's a moment in Hamilton. Actually, it's also a moment in real life, like, because that's just a play. It involves George Washington. And George Washington, you know, you know the story of George Washington, one of the fathers of our country, and he leads us through the American Revolution, and we get to the point where he's the president, unanimously picked to be the first president. Since when has that happened, when we can all agree on who the president should be? And then at the end of his term, he's like, okay, I'm going to step down now. And everyone's like, no, we need you, George Washington. Why don't you be president for the rest of your life? And in the musical, he's like, I got to teach them how to say goodbye. You got to teach them how to say goodbye. I've got to step away. And the nation's like, what do we do now? John Adams? That's a history nerd joke because, man, there's a big step down from George Washington to John Adams. What do we do now? And so these like concepts we get, and it's even more true with Jesus. Three and a half years, he's blowing everyone's minds. He's preaching in a way that no one has ever heard. He's challenging the authority of the corrupt. Uh, religious leadership in Jerusalem. He's coming through and he's, he's inspiring people to change their lives and point their lives back to God. And people are in droves coming to him. Thousands of people are gathering just to hopefully get a glimpse of him. This is before sound systems and microphones. They're just in big fields and they're like, I heard he's up there. I hope we get to see him. And then this whole thing happens where uh, he, he raises from the dead 
Over 500 people got to see him in that state and the word begins to spread. This guy rose from the dead. He is it. He is our guy. He is the Messiah that our people have been waiting for for all this time. And then Jesus is is preparing to go. And they're like, no, 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 stay. Stay. We want you to be our king. We want you to be our leader. We want you to help us take out the Roman government and reestablish, you know, the temple and all these things. And Jesus goes, no. I've been saying this the whole time. (laughs) I came from the Father. And I got to go back to the Father. And they're like, no, Jesus And he ascends back into heaven and his followers are standing there like, what do we do now? There's a moment in scripture that Jesus kind of predicts this and explains what's going to happen. We're going to be all over the Bible today. We open the Bible every single week to see God's most important truth for us. And if you've got a Bible, I want to encourage you to grab it. Uh, Look it up on your phone. It'll be on the screen behind me as well. If you don't have a Bible and you want to use one now or just one to have, we got free Bibles on the shelf back here by the door. Please grab a Bible uh, now if you want to or before you leave. Put your name in the front of it if you need a new one or just borrow it for the service. But we're going to be in John It's one of the four Gospels, one of the four biographies of the life of Jesus, John chapter 16. And in this moment, Jesus is explaining the fact that he's got to go. I know I've done a lot of things here. I know you're looking to me for leadership and guidance, but I got to go. John chapter 16, we pick up at verse 5. He says, but now, I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief. Because I've said these things, but very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him. I saw that the words weren't up on the screen here, but did you catch that? Jesus said, I got to go. I got to go. And they're like, why are you leaving? He's like, I got to go because if I, if I don't go, the advocate will not come. Who is the advocate? That's actually who we're talking about today. In the three-in-one conversation about God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the advocate is a nickname for what is most popularly called God's Holy Spirit. And so what I want to do today is the same thing I've done in the last two weeks with the other two parts, uh, the other two persons of the Trinity, is to ask two simple questions, okay? I've asked these same basic questions about the other two parts as well. The two questions are this. Number one, who is the Holy Spirit? Who is that? And number two, why does that matter? Why should that matter to me? Should it at all? And so first, who is the Holy Spirit? Uh, We see the Holy Spirit of God all throughout Scripture. I mean, literally from cover to cover in your Bibles, the Holy Spirit is active. Now, you might not always be aware that that's going on there. Uh, I want to point you to a resource, though. Uh, This is a resource that I used a lot in preparing for this series and has taught me a lot. Maybe you've heard of the Bible Project. Uh, Bible Project is a great organization. They're most well known for these videos that they produce about different books of the Bible and different biblical themes and different lessons in the Bible. I'm telling you, you could almost get like a seminary degree just digging into this content they put on their website. I got to Uh, website here, bibleproject.com, and I want to point you to slash podcast. Uh, Also, their app is amazing. Uh, We use their their app for our family Bible studies. It came out in January. Um, It's great. Check it out and just see if it's something that you want to get into. I'd love to tell you how we use it. But anyway, the podcast feature on that app and also on their website has got a lot of different series, and there's one, if you look for it, it's called Holy Spirit. And a lot of what I'm talking about today is coming from that. I want to give them full credit, but also let you know this. We are just scratching the surface of what they talk about, and they're just scratching the surface of who is the Holy Spirit. And this is where I think it's helpful for us to help start today. Uh, it, it starts by learning a Hebrew word. Who is the Holy Spirit? The word is ruach. I want you to become a Hebrew scholar with me this morning and say ruach. Ruach. You got to get the spit gurgling in the back of your throat to really get that out. Ruach. Okay. Ruach is a word. Let me tell you what ruach is. Um, the ruach is, uh, the ancients understood it as this invisible energy that impacts the world. There was a lot of ruach yesterday in Wilmington. It was blowing branches out of trees in my front yard. There was pine straw everywhere, pine cones. We did a Boston butt sale for our Boy Scout troop, and there was these boys holding signs like, uh, hey, come by barbecue. These poor boys looked like they were about to be kites, and the signs kept flying across. You know why? Because the ruach was strong. What is ruach? Wind. It's a word that means wind. That was one uh, understanding of the word ruach. Here's another understanding. We're doing it right now, a lot of it. In fact, we're going to ruach together. Everyone take a deep breath. Let it out. That was a good deep ruach. Your ruach is your, your breath. 
The ruah is the invisible energy that we see moving things in the world. The ruah is the invisible energy that we see animating our bodies. It's our breath. And the third understanding of ruah is spirit. The first time we see the word ruah in the Bible is in the second verse of the Bible. So if you still got your Bibles and want to flip all the way back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, it says, now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And in the original language, that would have said the ruach of Elohim, the ruach of God, his invisible energy, presence, power was just there. Now, now think like an ancient, okay? How do you describe the spiritual realm? Something I can't see? And it does stuff. It's really cool that they chose that word to describe the spirit of God. And, and also, incidentally, when you look at this moment, this is going to be something that, it puts a framework about what the spirit of God does. It says that the spirit of God was hovering over the waters of the deep, One thing the Spirit of God is obsessed with, it seems, is to come into chaos and to bring order. So if you look at the creation narrative, what you see is is chaos. There's just the waters of the deep. When you see waters and deep and darkness, that's an uncertainty. It's it's, it's kind of metaphorical in ancient times, and you kind of see it that way. And then what immediately happens after that is that creation happens. So order comes out of chaos. And you're going to see that theme if you follow it throughout the whole Bible. When the Spirit of God moves into a situation, he brings order into chaos. And so throughout the Bible, we see the Spirit begin to work. The first time we see the Spirit working within people is when humans are created. And so we see that God makes man out of the earth, dirt, mud, clay. I wasn't there. I don't know what it looks like. I'm picturing a statue. I don't know. But do you remember how God animated that person, he breathed into his nostrils. Ruach. And there's a really cool word play there. There's, there's the word play of him using his breath, ruah, to create life, which is this animated spirit, this unseen power. Isn't that neat? And so there's the first time we see him interacting with humans, is bringing life, and then we just see it start taking off. And so uh, we see him uh, it, it working in the life of Joseph, for example. The, the spirit comes in, and what the spirit does in the life of a human is to give them the ability to do things that they aren't able to do on their own. Joseph is a person, he's the story with the guy with the fancy coat and all the brothers, and he ends up going to Egypt, if you know that story. And the Spirit of God gives him the ability to interpret dreams. And it works out really well for Joseph and thousands of other peoples because through the interpretation of that dream, uh, they were able to save lives, and that's really cool. Then you see the Ruah of God working in people for like creative purposes. There was a guy who was inspired by God's Spirit to be creative, and he kind of decorates and builds the tabernacle, the place where God's Spirit will kind of reside and the place where the people can come and to worship him. We see the Spirit of God moving mightily in warriors like Gideon and others in the book of Judges to do crazy things to win like military victories over the enemies of God. We talked in week one of this series about the little G gods versus the big G God, and that's one of the things God uses his spirit to do is to uh, go against the nations that are serving the little G gods. And so the spirit of God moves in that way. We see the spirit of God moving through prophets as they just speak the truth of God and help keep the nation of Israel on course. We see the spirit of God active in the life of kings like David. David was just he was, a, he was a failure in a lot of ways. He made a lot of mistakes. But it, even though he wasn't perfect, the Spirit of God used him in mighty ways to a point at which he could be one of the greatest leaders the nation of Israel ever saw. And Scripture calls him, above all others, one who was seeking the heart of God. That's what the Spirit of God does in this world. When you get near the end of your Old Testament, we've just taken a crash course through the whole of the Old Testament. You get near the end, the last group of books are called the Prophets. And something kind of shifts in the wording about God's spirit, his ruah, in the book of Joel. So if you can find Joel in your Bible, I know you probably all read it this morning, so you got your bookmark set. Joel's not a book you probably go to very often, but Joel's in there. You can find it in the index. I'll have a passage on the screen here in a second. But Joel is going to talk about kind of a shift in the interaction of God's spirit with mankind. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 30 is all we're going to read. You can keep reading the whole chapter if you want to. But in Joel 2, 28 through 30, it says this. This is God speaking, by the way, through the prophet Joel. He says, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit, my ruach, on all peoples. I will pour out my spirit on all peoples, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. 
even on my servants, both men and women. I will pour out my spirit on those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. That dramatic language. Something's going to happen. And so the nation of Israel, those paying attention and those who become the ones who read Joel, and they're like, well, when's that going to happen? What's going to go down with the Ruach, the Spirit of God now? Because they knew that God, if you're Christian and you've been in the church long, you might have the impression that the Holy Spirit's like a new thing. We got that with the church. We started that. No. God's Spirit's always been active in the world. And so they see this in Joel and they're like, well, well, what's going to happen? How are things going to change? Then Jesus shows up. We talked about Jesus last week. I don't want to skip through his story too much for if you don't know it super well, but Jesus shows up, and remember last week, we, we talked about a moment in Jesus' life where he got baptized, and, and in that moment, Jesus goes into the Jordan River, and he's there with John the Baptist, and, and the whole of God's presence shows up, at least as much as that moment can handle. We see God the Father and his voice coming down. This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And we see Jesus, God incarnate in the flesh, and he's standing in the water about to get baptized and going on this three and a half year amazing ministry. And then the Spirit of God, the Ruach, comes down like a bird. He shows up like a dove. That's the moment. You remember that moment? Joel said there was going to be a pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And I like to think of this as like the first trickle. Trip, trip. The pouring is coming, and it's going to start to ramp up as the Jesus story goes. Because through the Spirit of God, Jesus does some amazing things. We talk about Jesus all the time, but man... He starts to speak in ways that no one's ever heard. He starts to perform these uh, wonders and signs and miracles. And he does it all through the spirit of God. And of course, he dies on the cross. But do you remember what the Bible says, how he raised from the dead? What power raised Jesus from the dead? The spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead. He was active in that moment. The same spirit that was there hovering over the waters of the creation. And in the first creation, it's like in this trickle as it begins to pour out, a new creation begins to be inaugurated. And if you've ever seen that first little rain of spring when the little buds start coming up and the little things start growing, that's what I picture like in the heavenly realm. I don't even know if that's a good analogy. It's weak to describe the wonders of God, but I just see it start to happen. And then Jesus rises from the dead. And after his resurrection, his disciples are like, what do we do now? He says, I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to wait. This is in Acts chapter one. I want you to wait and I'm gonna send my helper. Another nickname for the Holy Spirit. And then in John chapter 20, sorry, I skipped this part. The resurrection, the ascension hasn't happened yet. John chapter 20. So Jesus has risen from the dead. The disciples are terrified, okay? Because Jesus had been arrested for basically treason. Uh, he'd been arrested for blasphemy. And they're guilty by association. So I don't know if you know the whole story, but man, they run, they hide. Peter denies Christ. All these things happen. So they're, lock- they're literally locked up in this room because they're scared. And Jesus just walks through the door, like phase shifting matter, resisting, ignoring. He gets in there, and and this is what happens in John chapter 20. So sorry, I skipped this part. John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. And Jesus came, and he stood among them, and he said, peace be with you. Which, of course, he had to say because they were wetting their togas. They were like, you're dead, Jesus. He's like, I'm not dead. After this, he showed them his hands and his side. He wanted them to see, like, I'm real. Yeah, I did that. But it's over now. I'm in my resurrected body. 21. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, you ready for this? He breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Have you ever noticed that verse? I remember the first time someone really pointed out to me, I was like, he did what? Like, can we just call this weird? If someone walked up to me and was like, hey, <clears throat> I'm like, dude, what do you do? Like, that is not culturally acceptable. Jesus doesn't do this for some cultural reason. I believe Jesus in this moment is reenacting the creation moment where the Ruach of God comes onto the first man 
in the first creation. And he's saying, listen, the new creation is here. Receive my spirit. I've got work for you to do. And he sends them out. And that's the beginning of a brand new way God's spirit is going to start to link up with mankind. Now, now Jesus ascends into heaven, okay? And it's a couple of weeks later. It's like six weeks later. We're, we're, we're sitting there in Jerusalem. It's the week of Pentecost, which is a huge moment where a lot of people make pilgrimages into Jerusalem from literally all over the world. And they try to come in there for, it's a religious festival type thing. And uh, in, in the book of Acts, in chapter two, starting in verse one, remember the trickle, 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 trickle. God begins to open it up through a constant stream of Jesus' miracles. Then he breathes on the disciples And in Acts chapter two, verse one, it says, and when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house that they were sitting in, wind. Um, This is not just a windy day. This is not a meteorological event. The presence of God is showing up. His ruach is here again. Verse three, it says, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came and rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Last week, the Spirit showed up as a bird. This week, he showed up as fire. These are symbolic ways of describing like, what does it look like when there's a tangible element of God's Spirit in the presence? I don't think it's like real fire fire where there's like, okay, we're going to have to stoke this thing and keep some wood in it and keep it going. It's just like, how do you describe the presence of God? And I'm just thinking that Luke, who wrote this, was like, it was like, it was like fire? That's what everybody said it looked like? Fire-ish? And they begin to do something really wild. They begin to speak in other tongues. These are languages that this morning at breakfast, they did not know these languages, and now they're just speaking them fluently. You know how I know? Because in verse five, it says, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Remember, I said Pentecost was like a pilgrimage type time. So people have come all over the place to come in Jerusalem and to celebrate. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. They're like, we're in Jerusalem. Is that, is that Egyptian? Whoa, man, he's just going at it over there in Egyptian and whatever language is being spoken, utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? By the way, if someone in Jerusalem back in the day said, aren't you a Galilean? That's kind of like if like, you're in Charlotte or Raleigh or New York City or something, and the big city folk are like, ain't you from the mountains? Like, aren't you like a hillbilly? Aren't you like a redneck? Like, when they talked about the Galileans, Jerusalem was the hub, okay? Galilee was like this outskirts area. And so they weren't just saying like, where are they from? They're saying like, I didn't know Galileans were smart enough to know those languages. Like, that's, that's what kind of people were saying. Not true. We all got a little bit of redneck if you're a good person, right? But that's what they're saying. And then in this moment, they're like, I can hear them teaching in my own language. Then how is it that each of us hears this in our own native language? The writer, this is in verse eight, and I'll skip through a couple verses. He lists 13 different nationalities that are represented in this crowd. And all of them are able to hear something that they can understand from their home tongue. And the second half of verse 11 says, And we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? The Ruach of God has shown up, blowing their categories all to pieces. They don't know what to do with this. They feel it. They see it. God's on the move. Now that they've seen the resurrection of Jesus, many of them had seen the resurrected Jesus, and now that they're seeing the power of God active in these people, some in the crowd are like, maybe they're just drunk. Like, this is, this is weird that it actually says that. Then Peter gets up to preach, verse 14. He's gonna preach a whole sermon. I'm not gonna read the whole thing because I'm in the middle of a sermon myself, and that's just like too much sermon in one day. But in verse 14, Peter stood up with the 11. He raised his voice and he addressed the crowd, and he says, fellow Jews, And all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you say. It's only nine in the morning. Now, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Remember that guy? In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and women. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. That sound familiar? 
And the people who were there were like, I mean, these are the religious elite, like not elite, but they're religious, they're, they're paying attention. They traveled to Jerusalem for Pentecost, okay? Like they're serious about their faith. They're familiar with Joel and they're like, that's what this is? You know, my grandma taught me about this. She said one day it was gonna happen. What? That explains why I can hear these things in my own tongue. That explains all the events that happened with Jesus. Peter goes on, he begins to explain to the crowd. He, he, he relives the last few months with them. He's like, look, you, get, you guys have heard about Jesus. He made such a big row in this city, right here in this town. Uh, he did miracles and he taught so many ways. You, got, you were there, you were there, I remember you. You know, Jebediah, you were there, you were on the front row, okay? And then a couple weeks later, you guys were all shouting, crucify him, crucify him. You know what you did? You put to death the chosen one of God. That was you. And the people in the audience, they knew because they were there. <laughs> Skip all the way down to verse 36. He says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter gives the first invitation to a group of people to become followers of Jesus in this new way with the spirit being poured out on everybody and everything's gonna change. This is what he says in Acts chapter two, verse 38. He says, well, this is what you should do. You should repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and then you will receive the gift of the Ruah of God, his Holy Spirit. And the next verse said that those that accepted the message that day were baptized. There were about 3,000 of them that day. Those 3,000 people received the gift of God's Holy Spirit. The Ruah of God that was active in creation, the one that hovered over the waters of the deep and brought order into chaos. The Ruah of God who had carried God's people through the centuries and brought his truth through the prophets and the kings and the other teachers. The one who had filled uh, so many people with direction and inspiration and abilities to do things they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. The very spirit of God who had just recently in Jerusalem risen his son from the dead. This spirit of God is poured out onto the people who accepted Jesus. And that's a promise that's opened up to anyone from that point on. That the Spirit of God could come and live in you and it'll change you. And so, yeah, yeah, after three and a half years, Jesus stepped away. But he's not gone. God is not gone. That's the whole purpose of this three in one series. Is there's one God that we serve, and he interacts with us in a lot of different ways. But his spirit is now available to anyone who will call upon his name. And this is probably what Jesus had in mind when he was teaching his disciples way back in John chapter 14. When we read it at the beginning, you remember? And they were like, where are you go? And he's like, I gotta go. Because if I don't go, the advocate won't come. And we're gonna go back to John 14 and just pick up at the end there, verse 25. Jesus says this about the Holy Spirit. He says, all this I have spoken while I'm still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. God's really able to be with you. I, I've heard it described that the Holy Spirit moves into your life like a roommate. You've got your own soul going on, your own ruach, if you will. And he's like, let me move alongside you. You're gonna have to redecorate your room a little bit. You're gonna have to redo the way you live your life a little bit. But I wanna come and I wanna guide you. Who is the Holy Spirit? We had two questions this morning. Who is the Holy Spirit? One, he is the presence of God active in our life. He's been called the advocate, the helper, the comforter, the teacher, the, the, he's the direct connection between us and God. That's who the Holy Spirit is. Whether you live for God or you don't, God's presence is in this world through his spirit. And he's actually knocking on your heart all the time. The second question was, so what? Who is the Holy Spirit? He's the active presence of God in our lives. So what? Well, there's a couple things that I'll, I'll list out for you that, I, that I'm kind of convicted of. The first one is this. Uh, the spirit of God convicts us of sin. You ever had that little voice that's like, this is bad. 
Walt Disney taught us that it was a cricket named, you know, who's that guy's name? Jiminy Cricket. Yeah. Always let your conscience be your guide. They put Pinocchio in the Disney vault. I think they need to let it back out. That's a good movie. But Jiminy Cricket is not the Holy Spirit. When you feel convicted that something is wrong, that is God's spirit tapping on your heart saying, I didn't make you for this. Now, we can ignore that to the point where we don't hear it anymore. Just like your kids did if you're a parent. <laughs> But God's always tapping on our mind going, this is not right. I want you to seek me. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. You can read more about it in John 16, 8 through 11. But basically that passage says, you know, the righteousness of God is made known to us through his spirit. And also we're, we're led to do the right things. And so sin isn't fun to talk about, but it's what separates us from God. And God's spirit, even before we choose to live for him, is telling us, you can do better. God has better for you. Will you please listen? Lean into me. That's the power of God. That's how much he loves you. Um, and he continues to do it after, after you choose to live for, for him. The next thing that God's spirit does for us is God, God's spirit teaches us how to find him. So what good would it do if he's like, hey, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You ever had a, an employer like that? You know, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. And never tells you how to make it right. <laughs> but God's like, no, I'm not just going to show you that something's wrong. I want to also help you find me. There's so many different passages in scripture that can teach us this, but I love 1 Corinthians 2, 13. It teaches us this way. It says, this is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities in spirit-taught words. This was written by the apostle Paul, and what he's explaining is like, we apostles, these are the first leaders of the church, but even to this day, if you're spirit-filled and you have the power of God in your life, God will guide you to teach correct things and he'll guide you towards him. But more specifically, we have God's word written down in, in, our, in our Bible, and this was led by the spirit. Here's one thing I believe about the Bible, okay? There's a lot of stuff that you could talk about the Bible, pros and cons and all kinds of things and understanding about language and all kinds of, we're not getting into that, we just don't have time. But I'll tell you this, did you realize the Bible is not one book? It is 66 books, okay? It was written over the course of a thousand years by over 40 authors that lived on three different continents and, and, in, and in three different languages, okay? Now, now if, if me and, and Josh were like, hey, listen, let's play a game. Let's, me and Josh and Patrick, okay, we're gonna write a book. Okay, but here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take five years, all right? I'll write the beginning, you write the middle, you write the end. Let's not talk to each other about it and let's just see what happens. I mean, that book would be a hot mess. Who knows? Like, Josh is crazy, and who knows what Patrick's going to talk about, right? Over 40 authors, over the course of a 1,000 years, three continents, three different languages, but from cover to cover. It is a consistent, in fact, beautifully consistent and congruent message from cover to cover. My faith is that the Holy Spirit guided that process. God's Spirit leads us to truth. Convicts us of sin, leads us to truth. And the third thing is that God's Spirit transforms us. Yes, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is the thing that we accept uh, God's grace in. We say, I believe that God loved me this much. I believe that he did these things for me. But once we accept Jesus, the spirit comes into our life to transform us. He's like, I, don't, I love you, but I don't want to leave you the way that you are. I want to help you be more like me. And we can't do that on our own. So his Holy Spirit comes to move among us. That's why he's our teacher, he's our advocate, uh, he's our comforter. He's, one, one place calls him our tutor, also teacher. I love that idea because you just need a guy, you need a mentor. And there's places in scripture that say, for example, that the Spirit speaks for us and groans too deep for words. My understanding of that is this. You ever have one of those days where you're just like, at the wit's end, you're ready to pull your hair out and you're just like, oh, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> you know, that's your prayer. Oh, God, help me. Well, the, whole, the Holy Spirit translates that. Ah, uh, yes, Lord, what, what Chris meant was, uh, if you would please help him through this instance at work, because right now he's dealing with this and this and this. The Spirit speaks for us when we don't even know what we need for ourselves. There are so many different things the Spirit comes to do and transform us. One thing that we see uh, in the book of Titus, uh, chapter three, verse four through seven, this is cool. Listen to the transformation that happens. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit in whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having hope of eternal life. He transforms us. And the, another big thing, that, the transformation process, you, you hear that, becoming heirs of eternal life? You know, when you, when you come into Christ and you accept the sacrifice of Jesus and his spirit moves into your life, you get adopted. 
You become a fully fledged child of God. And guess who oversees those adoption papers? Let's read it. Romans 8, 15 through 16 says, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship or to daughtership. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And that ruah that began a new creation has been poured out and our lives become transformed. Where does that leave us today? So what? Um, There's a lot of places we could go with this. It is so important for us to realize the huge offer God makes through his spirit to show us daily the way back to him to guide us in our decisions, to bind us together when maybe we wouldn't have otherwise been friends even. But through the spirit of God, we can have fellowship to transform us and to use us as his hands and his feet. There's this whole concept called spiritual gifts where it's like, I'm gonna empower you to do things for the kingdom of God that without me, you wouldn't be able to do. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive my Holy Spirit. And if you have received the Spirit of God in your life, he's got a mission for you. The Great Commission where Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, he says, listen, go into all the world, make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and I will be with you always to the very end of the day. How is he gonna be with us? Through his spirit. He wants us to go and impact this world with the love of Jesus. That's what the spirit's active in our life for. And he'll help us manage all the little things. And he'll help us manage all the big things. And if you don't know the spirit of God in your life, I just wanna invite you to, to let him in. We just read Acts chapter two, verse 38 and maybe you're sitting in your seat right now going, Brothers, what shall we do? I'm gonna quote Peter. Repent. Repent means turn your heart back to God. And be baptized. Baptized, Baptism is a beautiful moment of recognizing this decision that you're making, like a wedding ceremony maybe with God. And you will receive the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if you've never accepted Jesus in your life, you've never been baptized, you don't know the Spirit in your life, can I invite you to do that today? what I want to encourage you to do is to talk to somebody before you leave. The best way to do that is in just a minute, we're going to have communion and some of our elders and other leaders will be back there by the back communion table. Make your way back there and just talk to them. Let them pray with you. Let them use the spirit in their life to empower your life. Or maybe say for the first time, I need to make this decision. And we can set up some time for you to get baptized even today. Don't worry. We know where warm water is. (laughs) If you're already living in it, God has breathed into you because he's got a plan for you and he wants you to impact the world with that. Jesus said, all this I have spoken while I'm still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Let's pray.